this week on the Back Table Podcast. If you would have asked me 10, 15 years ago what minimally invasive is, I would have probably not been quite as inclusive as I am today. I used to say no stitches. I used to say no general anesthesia. You know, those things have evolved. One of the nice things about what we do and you and I do is we have one distinct advantage that we do try to help with, and that's the imaging. Like we could sit here and say, oh my God, we all got the greatest hands and we're all good. And that's all great. It is, but probably there are people in every subspecialty, but we do have one really, really distinct advantage and that's the imaging. And then whether you choose to adapt your imaging from sort of your inpatient IR suite to an outpatient IR suite or a C-arm, you, you may, but you still take that advantage of how you learned the ability to see everything. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable MSK Podcast, your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Backtable.com. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, doing a Sunday morning edition, and uh, Dr. Wayne Olin is kind enough to meet me here, and we've been talking about doing this for a long time, but this is Dana Dunleavy from Buffalo, New York. And Wayne, can you uh, start off with a little bit of your origin story? Sure, Dana. First and foremost, obviously, thank you very much for having me. It's not just a privilege talking to you, but calling you a friend and a colleague um, as well. My name is Wayne Olin. I am the director of minimally invasive and endovascular neurosurgery at the George Washington University Medical Center in Washington, D.C., I am an interventional neuroradiologist, though by training, although I am a part of the neurosurgery department at GW. Grew up in a small country called Long Island. I uh, went to med school in Chicago and then um, residency back in New York and then did my diagnostic and neurointerventional fellowships here at GW. Ended up staying in the D.C. area, did a little stint in private practice sort of in between. I was sandwiched with academics at GW and now back for the last 12 years at GW, but part of the neurosurgery group, although with an academic radiology appointment, but part of the neurosurgery group now where I'm the director of minimally invasive neurosurgery at GW. That is amazing, wonderful, and I'm sure we'll get back a little bit more detailed into different parts of that, but this is a big interest throughout our specialty about the different ways to practice and you've really done it all in terms of different ways right and do you want to tell a little bit of how your practice was back in bethesda initially we can say when i was at johns hopkins and knew that i needed some additional spine training i came out and worked directly with you at that time you were with a radiology group yeah so You'd like to look back and say, boy, I, I was able to navigate this myself and plan it out myself. But in reality, sometimes with career changes, you're more of reactive as opposed to proactive sometimes. And so I was at GW for six or seven years, young faculty, you know, did my training there, kind of worked my way up, ended up as program director of the radiology department. But most of the neurosurgeons left. And for an interventional neuroradiologist that becomes sort of barren territory, several of them went out into private practice in Montgomery County, which is one of the surrounding counties to Washington, D.C. at a small hospital, but a very forward-thinking institution called Suburban Hospital, which is where we first met. I joined a radiology group there. At the time, they were the oldest radiology group in America. And I think not discovered by Wilhelm Rankin, but I think one of his original partners you know, where they're staring at the fluoroscope going, woo. -hoo. And uh, so I joined a radiology practice. Now, when you join a radiology practice as an interventional radiologist, there's really not much for you to do in your subspecialty until you build it. So you're not stepping into an existing practice, but I was stepping into an institution that was looking to grow that line. So we grew it. And you sort of, you did what came your way you promoted your business, but also you had to grow things that you kind of knew already. And I had to cover some IOR as well, which, you know, you do as part of the team. And I tell you what, I learned such, so much of a ton doing that as well. You know, managing your stuff and sort of learning different techniques, even though 
the devices might be smaller in neuro IR. The techniques are very, very similar. And so I felt that that was also one of the great growth periods of my career. And that was where really interventional spine exploded for me also. You know, in 1995, we did two or three minimally invasive spine cases and thought we were busy as hell when Dr. Daramond introduced uh, vertebral augmentation to us at GW. But when we got out into the community, it was a real need for it. And once you sort of got involved with it and made yourself accessible and available and things are new, you start realizing, and I'm sure when we look back at what we're doing today, you realize that this may not be the gold standard in the end all. Let's keep thinking about better ways of doing it. And I was in a really advantageous situation um, in the community because we had a lot of volume, but also a lot of opportunity and not so much red tape. So I could grow things, look at new things and innovate. I wish I could say I was an innovator by, you know, sort of pedigree, but I was an innovator more by necessity and uh, got involved in teaching. And that really turned into, I think, one of my great passions now in medicine is not just teaching residents and students, but teaching colleagues. And that's where you really see expansion of your ideology. But I also find that I learn more teaching colleagues probably than they ever learned from me. I'm sure 50% of the time, and Dana, I know you do a lot of teaching as well. Somebody will raise their hand and ask a question and you're going to think, man, in a million years, I would never do it that way. But every now and then you're at a course and, you know, we're all in the our little islands of sort of what we think, what we do is 100% correct and gold standard. You'll hear another perspective. And I love listening to other perspectives. I think it, it really broadens my horizons, whether I accept them or not. And then about 12 years ago, there was a change at GW in the uh, neuro IR department, which at that time was had a neurosurgeon in it. And a chairman who I essentially trained with back in my early days at GW called me up and said, would you come back? I said, well, I don't really want to come back 100% as part of radiology. I do believe that the interventional community, whether it be neuro IR or IR, and radiology sometimes are not the best partners in crime, so to speak. And I can give a couple examples um, for that for me and really simple ones, but it's just a different way of looking at things. And it's really a very, very different professional experience. Well, my chairman came to me and he said, you know, would you come back? And I said, well, how would that work? You know, he was like, well, you'd be part of neurosurgery. And then I went to talk to the chair at GW and I said, is that okay with you? Uh, I'm still trying to make sure that I kept all lines of communication open and didn't kick down any doors. I wasn't quite so bold yet. And uh, he was like, yeah, we don't really want any part of that anymore. And they were very happy, you know, sort of giving that away, so to speak. And now for the last 12 years, I've been part of neurosurgery. But the good part is, I believe that my sort of net or my, my reach is logarithmically in increased. So I see now and train, you know, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, radiologists, IR docs, neuro IR docs, pain management. I have a much bigger reach than I had when I was just part of radiology. That's wonderful. Curious about several parts of that. You know, one part back in the day, as you noted, you know, you wanted to be a helpful part of that radiology team. And even though you were doing some of the most endovascular spine and intracranial endovascular work in the country, like you said, you were still doing pick lines in between those cases. There's a uh, blogger out there and he was part of the last edition as we're talking about this independence of interventional radiologists taking different paths. And he uses a term called the trash collector and it it's not supposed to have a bad connotation, but just to say that, you know, we all have certain work that no one necessarily wants to do, but you do it, you know, because the hospital needs you and because your department needs you. Now, I assume as a uh, director of endovascular at neurosurgery department at GW, you're probably not doing pick lines. Is there a different type of work that you do that's not desirable, but you do to help the department? Oh yeah, there absolutely is. And, and one of the, the benefits, and I just want to paint the picture so anybody listening can kind of understand what's great. I'm also part of the IR faculty at GW and we have an IR residency. And in that curriculum, we've added stroke and spine. And I think that really helps benefit those IR residents or fellows who come out 
and increases their marketability almost instantaneously. But the, there is no question, and you know this, Dana, so we do a fair amount of pain relieving procedures. And if you ask me about what procedure do I do that essentially no one else in the institution will do, and I do it because you want to be accessible, and, and I also think there's value in the access is the disc biopsy. You know, dude, I do some disc biopsies, you know, and you do them, and, you know, the patients are usually very, very uncomfortable. They're not the most fun, but you do them. The yield is not the most phenomenal, but you do what you have to do to provide the service. I did a ton of pick lines in my day, and you'll hear me say this to anybody who's asking. I still, every now and then, will have to be the guy who goes in the room prior to a coiling or something else to get an IB access. And those skills I learned putting in pick lines and doing thyroid biopsies with ultrasound are skills I would never trade back. So I, I would suggest that everybody does them just for a week, two weeks, whatever, just to know what it's like to stick very small vessels or very small spots, you know, under ultrasound guidance. That skill has been one that I will take with me and has been the most valuable going forward. At the time when I was doing it, when I thought it was the most menial task. And I assume there are probably, you know, other types of not necessarily glorious things that you might do. You know, Friday afternoon, I got a call from a neurosurgeon. Hey, can you place this butt drain in? You know, got a post-op seroma. You do a lot of those? I do a fair amount. The other thing I'll also do, and you've mentioned the Friday afternoon is, you know, and every one of those sentences starts with, hey, I got a guy or I did a guy. And now I do a fair amount of post-op. Remember, wherever you are, when we'll talk about this, I'm sure going forward is locations I practice because now I practice at several different locations, but I do, you know, a fair amount of pain relieving procedures and you get the, you know, I got a guy, remember we're in Potomac, Maryland or DC. And it's a very different echelon. You know, we see everybody from, you know, somebody that was, you know, homeless in the subway in the Metro to the president of the United States. But you get the guy, you know, I'm traveling on Friday or on Saturday and I got, you know, L4 with Dick. Is there any way you could squeeze the guy in and see somebody? And I do a fair amount of blocks, pain relieving procedures. And you get that call just like that. And, it, you know, everybody else's lack of planning turns out to be our emergency. But I also think one of the strengths of our fields is at some point, everybody in our orbit comes to us asking for help. And you try to be there because with that case that they ask for help for will come the rest of your portfolio of cases that you do. So I think that's sort of the nature of being an IR or INR. And I always tell all the students and residents that pay attention because at some point, every single physician will come through here begging for something. Yeah. And, and although this is a little bit of a tangent it's related to what you said, one of the things that you've taught me and you've, as you said, really been involved in the teaching of pain to every specialty involved. You know, what is your idea of facet block versus medial branch block? And partially, I mentioned that, right? Because you treat a lot of professional athletes in the process. And sometimes what they need is not necessarily the same as what an 80 year old needs. That, and on top of that, and you know this, how many times does the prescription just say epidural injection? You know, nobody's put their hands on the and on, regrettably, one of the great ironies in my career, right? I went into radiology and now I have clinic. I got to examine people. I mean, all the stuff I went into radiology to try and avoid, right? But now I got to do it. I mean, I'm sitting in clinic with my little clipboard and my white coat on. Um, I look in the mirror and I'm like, boy, somebody played a cruel joke on you, right? But you're right. You're 100% right. So at the end of the day, how you address the problem. And then, you know, there's always that little bit of, making the diagnosis on your own, especially when you disagree with the referral. So somebody may send something to you and it's a facet, you know, oh, can you do a facet block? And you examine the patient. There's no doubt in your mind, it's his SI joint, you know, and you try and call that referring physician. And of course they're on their boat or on their golf course or something, and they don't take the call, but you have this, and sometimes it's a professional athlete or somebody leaving for vacation or somebody honestly just wants to feel better. You know, at that point I've had built enough in your credibility equity box, essentially, to do what you think is right. Medial branch block is a great diagnostic procedure, there's no doubt about it, but it gives nobody long-term pain relief. And so for me, depending, and it depends what you're coming for. If you're coming for pain relief, 
you know, if you're going to head on and do an RF and the patient's already had an articular facet block somewhere else or whatever it is, and you have to do a medial branch block just to pull and go forward with your RF, well, that's one thing. But if you're really looking to give the patient any kind of, even if it's not the longest term relief, I really do like going into articular if I can. And more often than not, you can. Um, it gives the patient the best opportunity. One is to, you know, make the diagnosis because you will just the same. But two is what if they get, you know, really good relief. And then at the other end of the day is, you know, for most athletes that we treat, you know, you want to get them back on the ice or back, you know, on the court or back on the field. And so, you know, RF after medial branch block is one thing, but intra certainly gets them back quicker. And then if you have to do it again, three, four weeks later, or then go ahead on and do RF, well, then you do what you have to do because it did serve its purpose from a diagnostic standpoint, in my opinion. Right. And I think, you know, for many interventional radiologists listening to you, they might not have very much experience in interventional pain, but desire to get that experience. And so, you know, just to dwell on that a little bit further, some practices may say, well, you know, Wayne, and as we go back, you know, I was just thinking about this, you know, you, you became nationally known when you're working with NIH and, and doing talks at SIR and, and various other societies the past 20 years. But once you're known as Wayne throughout the world, I think that's your international reputation. So that's, that's good to be the Wayne. But, you know, some people talk about, right, that the most profitable way to go is just do medial branch blocks, right? Everybody's a rhizotomy. And I think that the way you practiced, right, is, is you do what each person needs and maybe they only need one intraarticular block and they're good to go. You know, so why did you put them down a path of a medial branch block? And I think you might say, you know, that's actually more profitable because doing a good job is really what builds your practice for life. I, I 100% agree. And especially there are some communities that are unforgiving as far as, you know, referral communities. You know what I mean? And so if I wasn't successful at getting people back, return to play, so to speak, they'd go somewhere else. You know, at the end of the day, that's my litmus test is those guys. Because also, and you know this, I mean, and you treat athletes up in Buffalo as well, is that they don't take it easy as much as you say to somebody. And even the management is not interested in take it easy. Um, they're interested in, in getting their investment back, return to play. And so I think I learned a lot in managing that because you can make anybody feel better laying in bed. You can but you can't make them feel better skiing the black diamonds. You know what I mean? That, that's where it comes in is that you, ha you have to get them back to do what they need to do and as quickly as possible, not just necessarily for them, but for the institution that may have sent you. Because remember, the referral pattern there is very, very different from a team or from an organization than it would be from a referring physician who has you know, a 60-year-old with a, you know, L4 with dick or something like that as opposed to a professional athlete who has a trip to Vancouver tomorrow and then an eight-day road trip in the Pacific Northwest, and they want to play. Yeah, and you make a good point, too, on what does that mean, you know, if they're lying in bed, for instance, even when they come in to see you in clinic the first time, some of them, right, say that doing okay until the spouse says, yeah, he's doing okay because he's not doing anything. You know, he can't do any of the things he used to do. Do you include something like that in your discussion? All the time. I want to know what you can do, what you can't do. What would you wish you could do? What's your level of activity right now? And it's amazing, right? How often, and I'm sure you're hearing it all in Buffalo. I'm sure your season's a little shorter, but boy, oh boy, I mean, pickleball has been sort of the, the new wave of injury in the older American. The amount of pickleball injuries I see now are just astonishing, ranging from I fell to a compression fracture, to shoulder stuff, to Achilles tears, you know, to other guys that I, I work with, um, knee injuries, things like that. So, you know, and then what do you want to do, right? What do you want to do? If I could get you back to something, what could I get you back to? How are we going to gauge this as a success? We take all that into account going forward. And I always think having someone else sometimes in the room can be helpful because it gives you sort of everybody's own personal vision sometimes isn't quite as crystal clear of what they're doing, what they're accomplishing. So whether or not you might take the spouse every now and then, you'll realize that the spouse of the significant other also may 
that might be a ridiculous conversation as well, but at least it, you threw that out there just to see. And then also, you know, you bring trainers in and um, team medical staff who don't do what I do, you know, sometimes because they already have forced an opinion. And if your opinion differs, especially like we were dealing with, you know, some royalty or things like that, or government officials in other places that they've come to you already, you know, with other physicians' opinions. And if you differ, you know, not only do you throw some confusion a little bit or whatever, but you've made their and your referring physician, it might be viewed as that they may not have been quite as complete in their eval as you are. So yeah, I just have to kind of tread a little lightly on some of those things. You can't just be blurting stuff out, but you learn to navigate that. It's, it gets pretty simple um, as you go forward. But I do think you learn so much at the end of the day, one, listening, but two, treating what needs to be treated. You know, I, I say this a lot. You don't treat the MRI, you treat the patient. And I, I'm an image, you know, a 50-year-old skier from Buffalo, I promise you his lumbar spine does not look perfect. But it's most important finding out what hurts. And really always look at the films yourself. Don't trust the reporting as much as I hate to say that to some of my radiology partners. But I'm just looking at it differently now than they might have looked at it. My knowledge of the clinical effect is a little bit more detailed. Now, I think we've, we've all spoken about how blessed we are by all the elegant and glamorous procedures we do, but I'm curious too about clinic and how that's been since moving from radiology to the Department of Neurosurgery. And one of the really actually cool things we did at Hopkins as an interventional radiology department is we had a shared fibroid clinic between interventional radiology and gynecology. It was a, a shared wing. You know, the patients come in with symptomatic fibroids. They got to see both of us. And they always came out feeling satisfied and confident. Do you do anything like that, given that you're in the same wing as the neurosurgeons that are just operating on spine every day? You just touched on something that probably changed my career, and that's that. So I'm part of neurosurgery clinic, and I was brought into clinic. Recently, my clinic got changed because my new chairman, who does spine, he's a, one of the busiest spine surgeons in America, he um, was like, I want you nearby my clinic and you know how often do you get this i'm in that clinic and i'm sure you got it in the uterine fibroid you know that stuff you do with particles well he would say i got a guy you know that crap you do can you come see the guy because the ease of presenting it and not making the patient come back and then he starts to see you also when they come back for follow-up that there is something sometimes in the right patient population to a lot of the procedures we do. I will tell you this, we don't do a lot of stuff, and I know this as a subspecialty that's unindicated. I believe that in my heart. And so he gets to see the success, not just the intake, he gets to see the post-op. And that's been in, invaluable to my practice growing within my department. And also in being much more inclusive, right? Now you become a guy that they rely upon. They have a patient who might not be the most easily put to sleep for something. And this kind of goes across the board. And you know this, Dana, as we have evolved into different procedures that either before we started or as we've developed them are fairly surgical, even though we use small holes. I mean, we put some pretty big pieces of metal now into people. And I think that the fact that my partners not only get to see and be able to refer it to me, but get to see the post-op and see that the decision that they made to refer that patient was the right one, carries a ton of weight to it. Yeah. So along those lines, you mentioned some hardware, you know, you have uh, societies like ASPN with thousands of members of neurosurgeons, interventional radiologists, interventional pain, orthopedics, you know, basically supporting work that you've, you become very busy in. So doing things like SI joint fusion, basal vertebral nerve ablation, and even what I think you were alluding to, which is indirect lumbar decompression and fusion. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I, I, I think one, you know, I kind of got my start in interventional spine a little bit backward, right? We were doing vertebroplasty first. And then somebody was like, can you do a facet block? And then you figured it out, right? And then you just figured it out and you figured it out and we evolved, right? If you think back about the stuff that I do every day now, 
Very little of it is stuff I did in fellowship. My fellowship stuff was very foundational, but you know, we evolve. And as we've gotten comfortable with more surgical or more implantable types of procedures, we've expanded into spaces. And as you touched on, we went vertebral augmentation and then vertebral augmentation with reduction or attempts at reduction. And now intraspinous spaces or degenerative spinal stenosis, let's group that all together. And now we're really looking at the SI joint as a subspecialty and as a group. And now minimally invasive techniques are really being developed, not for us just, but also by us to not just perform these procedures, but be the ones out there teaching it going forward. And the SI joint is a fairly complex of, of all the places we've treated. It's probably one of the more complex anatomical structures just because it's got the two joints and it's really not AP and lateral. It's much more oblique and the knowledge of what the SI joint looks like in a lateral plane, you know, is it, it's kind of interesting when you ask people where it is and they're like, well, well, it's not quite as intuitive as you might've thought going forward. And then it's not as well imaged unless you ask for it on MR and other things. And there, the clinical exam is also probably one of the more important things in diagnostic criteria, more so even probably than sometimes the imaging. So we're learning as we go. Um, if you would have asked me 10, 15 years ago, what minimally evasive is, I would have probably not been quite as inclusive as I am today. I used to say no stitches. I used to say no general anesthesia. You know, those things have evolved. And one of the nice things about what we do and you and I do is we have one distinct advantage that we do try to help with. And that's the imaging. Like we could sit here and say, oh my God, we all got the greatest hands and we're all good. And that's all great. It is, but probably there are people in every subspecialty. But we do have one really, really distinct advantage, and that's the imaging. And then whether you choose to adapt your imaging from sort of your inpatient IR suite to an outpatient IR suite or a C arm, you, you may, but you still take that advantage of how you learned the ability to see everything and the knowledge that you could put very little things into very little places in our careers across the board and throughout the body. We placed much smaller things into much more delicate spaces than we do around the spine in other aspects of our, you know, subspecialties. So I think you come with a confidence that teach me the technique because I should be able to add this to what I do. And the SI joint, I'm going to tell you, when we come back and look at this five years from now, the SI joint will be something that we have really brought into the fold. And you touched a little bit about on basal vertebral nerve ablation, which I think is sort of a foundational piece, but the disc and disc augmentation, disc regeneration five years from now, that's going to be something we do all day, every day as well. Yeah. We might have to have a whole segment on that too. And, you know, again, I think, uh, maybe you, you have better memory than me. You can remember when it was that you were presenting on discogenic therapies. I think that was probably around 2013 in DC at SIR. You know, and we looked at everything, right? We played around with a lot of stuff. There were gels and fibrin sealant and other products. And now stem cells are a prevalent product, not just in practice, but in discussion. You know, and you hear it mentioned out in the community or you hear it mentioned socially too. And people flinging PRP up against the wall. But the gold standard, and you know this, is clearly not written. And, and the final product is clearly not developed. And what's exciting for us is, and maybe we won't be around when that happens, but clearly the techniques that are used to get to there are going to be things that we really had a footprint in and a hand in teaching people how to do. And I take a lot of pride in that. And I know you do as well. Um, I take a lot of pride if you teach a class and guys go out and then they start to really benefit and not just them, but their patient population benefits from the success of the stuff that we taught them. And going back on what you were just talking about with SI joint and, and some of the, you know, special abilities we have with the imaging, I always think about it a little bit as, you know, someone that does screening mammography only, oftentimes you don't know what you're missing. If you bump into that other seat on diagnostic, right, then you start to see, okay, I can refine and improve what I'm doing on the screening seat. And I think to some degree, that's what we're blessed with, right, with the combination of C-arms, 
angiography rooms, cone beam, CT, CT fluoro. You know, we get that balance of saying, okay, well, when we were in this plane, this is actually where it was on cone beam, you know, so when you're sliding along someone's pedicle screw to get past it and get where you need to go, you know where it is in different planes. And some of the experience you've done with years and years of sacroplasty, which I think is still undertreated and, you know, has amazing morbidity and mortality benefit. But now you're utilizing as a principal investigator on a sacroiliac joint fusion study. And to move to that, just wanted to ask you a couple of things. One is, can you address a little bit your thoughts on why SI joint dysfunction is so underdiagnosed, right? Because I think even in your department, right, of neurosurgery, we discuss commonly in the multidisciplinary setting, right, that very common in these patients with lumbar fusions and particularly lumbosacral fusions, some of that biomechanical force shifts to the sacroiliac joint and it's very prevalent to get sacroiliac joint dysfunction. But it's not only the post-surgical patients. No, it's certainly not. And I think it's a much more common falls into that, oh, I threw my back out, you know, of the weekend warrior, but people don't diagnose it. I think the first limitation to SI joint and why it's underdiagnosed is imaging. I think the imaging doesn't tell the story. And then on top of that, a lot of times the imaging didn't even ask the story because it doesn't go far enough out. The average lumbar spine, and if you ever watch, somebody goes to an ortho clinic, neurospine clinic, back pain, MRI lumbar spine. They don't ask for coronal, you know, please include the SI joint. And you know that. One, coronal imaging is not normally part of anybody's routine. Two, a lot of times the SI joint isn't even on the imaging. Maybe you'll catch it a little bit on the axial imaging, but never on the saddle. It just doesn't go out far enough to cover the whole joint. And so right away, you start with the imaging. Well, it's not on the films. It can't be the spot that hurts. Second is a lack of physical exam, right? And whether you say it, you don't want to say, and if somebody gets pissed, well, I apologize if they get pissed. But, you know, a lot of times people don't examine people quite as well as they should. And once you start paying attention to the SI joint and just pushing on it, it doesn't take a lot. You'll be stunned how often you pick it up. Stunned. And then the last piece is, and this is in my opinion, and I'm sure someone's going to scream heretic at me a little bit, but the SI joint functions like two joints. And part of our diagnostic dilemma, to some degree, is figuring out which half of the joint's the one that's acting up on the patient. And so you do have to examine them. And I really believe the examination under fluoro sometimes, as you put them on the table before you put the needle in, can really be helpful. And there's going to be times you stick both the top and the bottom. But more often than not, I think people tend to miss the top half every now and then because they didn't examine the patient. So those things make it a spot. It's not the sexiest thing. And up until today, right, think about it from a spine surgeon standpoint, there's not a surgical fix for it, right? The spine surgeon is not looking at a spine patient they're looking at them from what surgical procedure do they need. And for the SI joint, there really isn't one until now. And, you know, now with a minimally invasive technique to treat the SI joint, if the patient needs that, obviously, you know, the block didn't work or other things. I think you're going to start seeing increase in diagnosis and um, less of sort of it being missed and more people looking for it. Um, but for years and years and years, you are 100% right. It was one of the most underdiagnosed things that came through my lab. And um, just because I was the one guy who put my thumbs, you know, on somebody's back and pushed on it and watched me very lightly be able to buckle somebody's knees with SI joint pain, I started paying attention to it. I think you made, made a lot of people and a lot of professional athletes made them feel a lot better because that spot not imaged so people don't pay attention to it. I also think, though, pardon me, going forward, you know, now that we're going to be involved, the SI joint is really something I think is very exciting. And in a lot of ways, the approach that got us here is the gold standard's not written. And now I'm really excited that we're going to be part of what the definitive treatment for these patients is, but providing that vehicle in the least invasive and very calculated, safe, reproducible an educatable way that can be done. I think the industry, I really do thank the industry for giving us this opportunity. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I look at it a little bit too, you know, if we think about our endovascular stent world for, for veins, right? I mean, we were using biliary stents up until pretty recently, you know, then we had an explosion of venous dedicated stents with really improved outcomes. And I think to some degree, that's where we are, right? I mean, if you look at some of the SI joint fusion devices up until somewhat recently, fairly traumatic, fairly large, and, you know, sometimes done in conjunction with spine surgery. So while some people that don't understand the SI joint too much are wondering, why are people intervening now? But then you talk to spine surgeons, right? They all admit this is very prevalent, right? I mean, when we have to go across the lumbosacral junction, we expect them to have sacroiliac joint pain. And sometimes we throw a bolt across to proactively prevent it later. But that's one point of fixation, right? And do you want to address one, two points of fixation and, and what requires a stable joint? Well, we just talked about it a little bit, right? It's two joints. Yes, our joint is two joints. And then one point of fixation in a circular or oblong football shaped, however you want to kind of adjust the shape of the joint, all it is eventually is a fulcrum, right? The joint's going to move around that one point. So I really do think at some point you're going to always need multiple, two to three probably, fixation joints to pin the joint down and not give you the center portion of a seesaw, so to speak, for that joint to move, which is why some of the posterior approaches too, and I don't know how many, you know, you've seen as well where, you know, sort of the dowel's not even necessarily seated well into the joint postoperatively. So there, the imaging, man, it really does come down to the imaging, right? The imaging and knowledge of the joint is going to be the way to really try to teach complete treatment of the problem. You got to know what it looks like. You got to know what it looks like in the oblique phase, you know, looking down the barrel of the joint. You got to be able to appreciate it in the lateral joint, in the lateral view. You got to be able to appreciate the sacral foramina in the inlet and outlet views so you know to be safe. What's fun about that, there's so much teaching, but the joint is, like I said earlier in our conversation, probably one of the more complex things that we've ever taught which is why it probably requires multiple focuses of fixation as opposed to just one, because the joint doesn't function in just one direction or in one plane. It really is almost infinite in the movement that it has. So one fixation device in one location is never going to be satisfactory in an SI joint. And given, you know, some of the many trials you've been involved in with sacroiliac joint dysfunction, do you want to address the, the devices or any particular device at all? And, you know, say, I think we could probably agree upon they're pretty elegant and gentle, so to speak. Well, that's one of the things I, I was really surprised about. Obviously, for many, many years, the gold standard was SI bone and their triangles. Um, it, it's a surgical procedure. I mean, those are some pretty big devices. And probably what they have available now called Torque which I know you've had your hands on as well, is much more amenable to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, everything kind of done over a K-pin, you size up, avoid minimal trauma to the surrounding area, but you can be really precise in where you place it. I think as you go forward with SI joint, you're going to get into approach and device, two different conversations. Is there an intra-articular approach that standalone I honestly probably don't think so. Um, I think you're going to have to cross the joint to get functional fusion of the joint. And whether or not you ever choose to go intra-articular with something else, sort of what's going to be, I think, labeled down the road as a hybrid approach, might be something you use and should be at least known about for more complex cases. But at the end of the day, what we're looking for in treating it in the same as what we look for in vertebral augmentation, the same as what we look for treating minimally invasive degenerative spinal stenosis, intradiscal is going to be reproducible, predictable, reliable treatment. And I do think going forward and what we've seen from the torque device is that whether down the road you end up having to add something to it, it may depend how long that patient has the device in for, how much of their life have they had it in for. 
as they get older, as potentially they maybe get more osteoporotic in their life, we need a second approach to augment, so to speak, the lateral approach. I think that's going to be something that we have to consider. Um, but at the end of the day, the most complete way is going to be from the lateral aspect. And do your surgical colleagues support you in this? Absolutely. I think from their standpoint, the surgical colleagues are in their defense or, you know, they've already very accustomed to the lateral approach. The lateral approach was the way of SI bone, is the way of SI bone. I think what everybody is ready for something a little bit less invasive, less traumatic, probably a little bit quicker to get clinical result, quicker to get the joint to move, less, easier to heal. And that's where we come in. Um, but I also think the opportunity for us to teach the anatomy, because it's important, man, the anatomy here is so important because I also think a lot of people just don't know it and maybe because they didn't pay attention to it, or maybe we didn't do a good job of imaging it, you know, going forward prior. But to me, the anatomy for you and for me is going to be one of the more fun things to teach going forward. Understanding this three-dimensional object in your two-dimensional planes. Yeah. I say, you know. Doing vertebral augmentation is pretty easy, right? You know, it's a big block. Doing sacroplasty, right? If it was straight, people would do it. And the sacroiliac joint, if it was straight, people would do it. But there's a lot of people that don't understand that anatomy too well. And going along with that and the imaging that you were mentioning, you know, last night there was a, a social media post, someone showing an SI joint block. And someone said, hey, you know, what are the angle you use for that? And he said, I don't know. Uh, and it made me think of Wayne, you know, doing one of his many courses where you jump in while someone's struggling to do any type of procedure. And even though you do all your procedures with a fixed unit, you usually grab the C-arm and show them the angle and you're like, now it's easy, right? Because you can see what you're doing. I mean, you and I have had that benefit, Dana. We have a toggle, right? Even in the OR, I and mean, you and I could extrapolate, but I think it's important that we learned being able to look at it in an infinite number of perspectives. And that's why I think going back, that's where one of our advantages is. And I'm going to tell you the big advantage is the lateral plane and sacroplasty really taught us that. Not a lot of people prior to sacroplasty ever looked at the sacrum in a lateral plane and had to know what they were looking at. And you'd be stunned when you show people some things like the anterior portion of the joint in a lateral of the sacrum of that they have just not really paid much attention to those lines or as and non-radiologists like to call shadows, things like that. And that's where I think a lot of the, I don't want to say the fun, but also the education is going to be is how we're going to make this safe, is really helping people understand that this joint not only isn't straight, isn't angle straight, it curves as it goes. And then what it looks like on both sides of the joint, what's the sacral side, what's the iliac side look like, and where are you safe, how do you avoid the foramina? And that makes it easy for us to extrapolate to the two C arms in the OR where neither C arm is moving, right? I mean, how often do you teach a class on equipment that is nowhere near comparable to what you use in your everyday? But the only reason why we can extrapolate it that way is because you know what you're supposed to see in your everyday. And it's easier that way than going from, you know, looking at a C arm image, you know, on an OEC 9800 and then going to your IR suite. And seeing things that you didn't even imagine were on that OEC 9800. And although, you know, again, just goes back to the fact that this is a complex joint, but the detector angles are not standard, right? It's not the same angle for every patient. However, do you have kind of a standard obliquity that you jump to at the beginning? And can you tell the audience a little bit what's an inlet and outlet view and, and why does it matter? Well, there's no question. So when you're looking at different views... So let's start out with what you talked about real quickly about obliquity. Every patient's different. But the obliquity that I want to see or at least appreciate at one point is straight down the barrel of the joint. And I'm going to tell you that in the top half of the joint, that obliquity is different than the bottom half of the joint. The bottom half of the joint is usually a little bit more in the AP. Remember, we're looking at it from the back to the front, right? Let's take it. The patient is prone, not supine. So we're looking at them from the back. So you're looking at the joint. The joint generally progresses or tracks medial to lateral in that plane. But the bottom half of the joint is much more AP oriented, 
where the top half of the joint is much more angled and oblique. And whatever you're trying to get to, I think you have to go forward and look at it and say, I want to see where I need to see it. You're never going to get the whole joint in one view. So you have to have the ability to manipulate the C-arm to appreciate the top half of the joint and the bottom half of the joint differently. Right? Inlet and outlet. And then the lateral view, you have to have to appreciate it. And again, as you said, one of the most important things about the lateral view is knowing honestly where the front of the joint is, but really getting a good lateral. Lateral to the patient is not necessarily lateral to the pelvis. So you have to spend some time, look at the hips, make sure they're overlooking each other, right? They're overlooking each other. So you have the hips lined up and then you have a little bit more of a confidence that you're looking kind of at the pelvis in its lateral view. The inlet and outlet views, they're APs and they're either angled cranial or angled quartered, right? The quartered protection is the inlet view. And it's best looking at the pelvic ring, a really good view for looking at the pubic symphysis um, sometimes, but it's kind of showing you the length of the sacrum to see how you are looking at it going forward. The outlet view, which is really cephalad, is really good for sometimes seeing the foramina. And what do you not want to do, right, with any screws? You don't want to hit the S1 foramen. That's really the foramen you're trying to avoid. So you have to be able to go back and forth between the inlet view and the outlet view in your pelvis because the straight AP view of your pelvis isn't really showing you, every now and then it will, but isn't really showing you the, what you need to see the S1 foramen and sort of the length of the, the body of the sacrum, um, where your screws are going to be and how they're going to relate to each other. For the first screw, it doesn't much matter so much, but as you get into the second and third, if you put it in a third screw, it really does. That kind of matters. And that's where you're really going to use that inlet view to make sure you have really good sort of placement of your screws in that AP plane. And like I said, the outlet view is really good for seeing where the S1 foramen is and making sure you stay the hell out of it. Love it. And uh, we're nearly closing out on this Sunday morning. But Are we? Oh, you're not ready? Oh, man. I know. No, I'm good, bro. Anytime I get a chance to talk to you, it's always, no joke, my privilege. I still have a couple of huge ones, though, starting with Super Simple. For guys that have never been involved with SI joint, which part do they want to be in? Which part of the joint for an intra-articular block? Well, it depends. So in my opinion, if somebody comes to you with SI joint pain and sciatica sort of, uh, leg pain, it's always the bottom half of the joint, always. Because you have the piriformis sling there. Um, they're probably leaking on the sciatic nerves, some inflammation down. That's almost always the bottom half of the joint. If you read some textbooks, right, that'll tell you there's an iliolumbar ligament, but it's only really out west. It's only in, in anatomy text. If you look at some anatomy text, I don't even mention it. You look at anatomy text from California, it's always in there. That's the top half of the joint. And in most fusion patients, patients who've had surgery, the top half of the joint is what initially gets insulted. And you, as you rotate off, you're going to see like a little crevice or for lack of a better terminology, a crotch or a V. And when you put the needle in there, that patient will tell you, doc, you're in the spot. So that's kind of how I differentiate. But at the end of the day, I really do differentiate it by physical exam. Because there's about a two to three inch gap between the top and the bottom of the joint. And the patient will tell you, where's your pain, sir? Where's your pain, sir? Where's your pain, sir? And all you got to do is use your thumb to push. And they'll tell you um, which half it is. But in the fusion patients, almost inevitably the top. And, and somebody listening to this may vehemently disagree. And I welcome their input. But it, for me, and there's no doubt about it, if you know the joint, right? The bottom half is the, that's the joint, the real joint, joint part. And so that's where the patient, you know, may have um, involvement of the sciatic nerve, which sits right underneath the SI joint. Yeah. And one of the reasons, right, why it's the masquerader is it's not one nerve. No, it's the whole thing. So, you know, a couple of things. One is anyone knows you, knows you are amazingly knowledgeable about everything we're speaking about, but also sports. <laughs> My mind is full of worthless tidbits of knowledge. Yes, yeah. that's true. So tell us, Backtable has been amazingly impactful in, in spreading knowledge across the country and actually internationally, as we were just talking about. So much so, right, that, that we just recently switched to having a musculoskeletal intervention section of it. And also there's a device section. And so 
you know, talking about people's different innovative aspects of their career is very interesting as well and how they got there. Can you tell us about Q Collar at all? Yeah, well, I can. Thank you for asking. I have been uh, involved in head injury stuff. Dana, we didn't really talk about it. I, I played lacrosse in college and then um, I coach high school here in the DC area, a school called Georgetown Prep. And we just finished up this season fourth in the country. Amazing. And lacrosse is a game that is like any other contact sport, you know, obviously football, but women's soccer, skiing, motocross racing um, has been wrought with head injuries. And I just came back from uh, the National Association of Trainers, their yearly convention, unbelievably well attended. It was in Indianapolis last week, and then we spoke about head injury. And then the other focus is Damar Hamlin. And those are the two focuses of these meetings now. I mean, you can wrap these and use K-tape all you want, but it's the focus of these meetings is on that. And so the Q-collar was a device that was born in the military uh, about 10 years ago by a uh, neurologist in the military at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, was asked a very simple question, why doesn't a woodpecker get a concussion? And the most expensive thing that can happen to our U.S. military outside of war, losing a war fighter, is head injuries during training, where you have trained a fighter and it costs, say, upwards of a million dollars to train each individual special forces warrior, and then you lose them to a head injury. So he looked into it. And, and battering rams, woodpeckers in nature have the ability to somehow, whether it's controlling their sternocleidomastoid, compress their jugular vein by about 30%. Not occluding, it's just compressing it. So you increase the amount of blood between your brain and your skull. If you do MRIs with the collar on, the collar off, all your venous structures are bigger with the collar on. Non-occlusive. In fact, it's only a pound and a half. So it's the same as wearing a necktie. So if a game you know, broke out while you were in church, you'd be good to go. Um, but that's really all it is because people are like, oh, what about intracranial pressures and your carotids? It's nowhere near the ability to change any of that. Any of the same risks of wearing a tie are the same risks of wearing the collar. So we have about 60 NFL guys right now wearing it over three to 400 college athletes, but other sports as well. But our big presence in the military, every special forces, whether it be Army, so Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, war fighters, are getting the collar as part of their kit. So in other words, they get their eye protection, their ear protection, and now their brain protection. And they get the collar. And we just fitted the entire Secret Service with it. And not the guys who run next to the limo, but the guys who are the snipers um, who will fire off a thousand rounds a day with the recoil. And we went out to Secret Service, you know, their training grounds, which is this unbelievable facility, an entire mock-up of Air Force One and of the beast, which was phenomenal to walk through. And the ability to protect these people has been unbelievably rewarding to me. And what a privilege. And so... You know, the more and more you see it, the more you see it. Now that you've noticed it, every NFL game has it. Professional lacrosse, a lot of guys are wearing it. If you're watching the PLL, the world championships right now, the entire Japanese team wears it. Downhill skiers, every sledder. So Bob Sled, Luge, they'll all be wearing it in the next Olympic Games. NASCAR drivers, think about the vibrations. And now we're doing a lot of work with the military looking at vibration and like the Havana syndrome, things like that. Can it be helpful in preventing vibratory injury? Because it seems there's some magnetic vibration warfare, and that's what people postulate the Havana syndrome to be. So we'll see. Yeah. And as you said, you know, pretty expensive, you know, to even looking at the, the value, so to speak, even if you can't put a financial value on it. But if we look at it, you know, and say, yeah, it's pretty expensive and important to train our military. And it's also costly to train our professional athletes. And, you know, one of the things we say in the high level athletes, right, is who gets there, right? And it's the guys that have been able to prevent injuries and prevent downtime. Those are the ones, right? Even the best athletes in the world that have a lot of downtime don't get there. Um, and, and you were pretty involved. The best ability is availability. And you were involved in our children, right? Uh, reviewing some of the studies to look at kids and basically, do you call it junior pop for football? Yeah, Pop Warner. So we're looking at all that. The collar right now is approved. You know, all the study was done at University of Cincinnati Children's and it's approved for ages 12 and up because uh, just that's what was in the study. And the next group of studies will expand all that. 
but it's about protecting kids from head injuries. I mean, look at the Boston University CTE clinic. If you play college football, college, it's not pro, college football, and your brain gets to that lab, 85% of something of high-end CTE. NFL, even ridiculously more than that. But in high school athletes, in the studies we did, we were seeing 70 to 80% white matter changes at the end of the season in athletes not wearing a collar compared to 20% in athletes wearing a collar. And you're talking about white matter shear injuries. You know, those don't heal so quick and those can tend to be cumulative. And so, and you know this because you, one of your biggest recreations is a very high impact sport. So let's make the game safer. Don't change the game. So we'll see. Yeah. And, and so as part of Backtable, some of the discussions have been, you know, people in academic, people in private settings, people in OBLs, all having involvement in things that you described today, you know, like being involved in clinical trials and being involved in innovation. What has been your involvement for Q Collar? Well, I'm on the medical advisory board, but basically I do for Q Collar, essentially what I do for, and what I'm passionate about. Three words, spread the word. I can't make somebody use, you know, the torque device. We can't make somebody use spine jack. We can't make somebody put the Q collar on. But I can certainly educate people and I can educate them with fact. And that's what I try to do. And then you make your own decision. You know, this is 2023 in the United States. You can't mandate anything, right? We can't mandate anything anymore. But if we use real facts, tell people, and it's funny. In athletes, if you include their spouse or their significant other, the adaptation is much, much more significant. Because I was involved many, many years ago, and you know, the junior say I lawsuit. Um, if you're a hockey fan, Bob Probert, you know, CTE is real. Brain injury is real. And the long-term effects, it doesn't stop when you stop playing. The brain is this amazing organ that is very rudimentary in its ability to heal. And so why not prevent the injury as opposed to hoping it gets better? You were once quoted as saying, uh, the most important thing we could protect. That's it. Why not do the simplest thing you can do to protect what's most important? Yeah, I'd take my broken finger, but I'll protect the other area. You know, the one thing I neglected to mention is money. And by that, I mean reimbursement. And again, the, the real focus and foundation of this conversation was to show interventional radiologist, a path that you took, which was innovative, right? Being in the department of neurosurgery. And one thing that some people might not realize is reimbursement is not quite as simple as you did a vertebral augmentation, right? So rates are negotiated separately. And oftentimes in the department of neurosurgery, it's not necessarily the same as in the department of radiology. Can you address that at all? Inevitably. Let's put it this way, in very simple conversation. It's never worse in neurosurgery. Never. So that's one of the big bonus. But if you went into anything we do, and I don't, I don't mean to preach for a sec, but if you're in it for the money, you're in the wrong thing. And I get that, but you still have to justify the cost and the ability to do it. And the upside of being part of a neurosurgical subspecialty, one, obviously across the board, there's multiple instances of where the reimbursement is improved the way that we collect. And it's amazing because you can collect and, and, and myself and my partner right now practice essentially as part of three or four different practices in our area of we've expanded stroke. Each practice has its own negotiation and its own reimbursement, not just the subspecialty. And I was really surprised going forward, learning that, that I could do the exact same thing in the exact same hospital. And depending who did my collection, my reimbursement was different. And so you need to look at that as well. Having said that though, there is no question about it by being part of a multi-specialty practice, any potential financial competition has gone by the wayside in any thought of, you know, apprehension in referring cases. And that's been where the gateway really has come. You know, they don't have to send a patient out. They don't have to get another appointment. I can come run over, whatever it is. But the ease of that, and then you hate to say it, but probably because we're of the same envelope, it makes it a lot easier for some to send 
stuff inside their own department than it is to send it outside. And, and that's been a truthful benefit to being part of a surgical subspecialty that is one of my largest referrers. And just to clarify, since, you know, people will want to know this, you are billing as a neurosurgeon. Well, I don't think you ever really bill as my neurosurgical department is billing it. Well, let me rephrase it. If someone in your department, whether it's Wayne or, or your chairman, as an example, does a lumbar fusion, the reimbursement is the same. Or the coiling. Let's jump in on that. The coiling, the carotid stent, the stroke treatment. There's no question about it. And, and those rates have been negotiated by that group individually. And so that's where the difference really comes. It's not based on my title or my training. This is what I've learned. It's based on the, the group that has negotiated out the rate and the neurosurgical groups have done a much better job. And honestly, because they care more about it. You're in a part of a radiology group that's doing your negotiation, honestly. And we kind of talked about it. We're better partners with the subspecialties that refer to us than we are with the diagnostic radiologist downstairs in a dark room. Fact, not fiction. Yeah. And one of our colleagues uh, from UPenn recently did one of these talks and, and he very elegantly described, you know, that we all went into medicine to help prevent suffering, right? And, and there are so many ways that we each approach that. And he was saying kind of like you did, right? It wasn't part of our, our residency or fellowship training, a lot of the stuff that we're doing now. Uh, but we're all involved in education because it's a growing area, right? And one of the things that that we both enjoy is multidisciplinary approach because we're we're in it for the outcomes. And thought it was interesting. A, a recent course I was at, one of the neurosurgeons was saying, you know, he goes into the room and we're talking about indirect decompression fusion and cleans the back and buttock area puts a long, you know, spinal needle up to the spinous process, drops some bupivacaine, goes out and scrubs, comes back. And just how impactful that is, the periosteal, you know, numbing, so to speak. And these are growing procedures, right? Because we have an aging population, patients living longer and uh, have a lot of low back pain and sacroiliac pain and maybe comorbidities, right? A lot of them are not appropriate for general anesthesia, but you can do a lot of the procedures we're talking about, minimally invasive surgical procedures with not too much anesthesia. Thoughts? Yeah. And then the other thoughts, the imaging, everything's becoming more and more image guided. There's very few blind procedures anymore, even surgical ones, pedicle screws, right? Very few guys put pedicle screws in without imaging. So image guidance has become our wheelhouse, so to speak. And so nobody knows more about it than we do. I don't care who you talk to. And I'll take that one to my grave, but I a hundred percent agree with you. You can do, and we're used to it, right? We're used to doing it minimally invasive. We're used to doing it and being efficient, right? Our efficiency, a lot of times, because it's your room over and over and over again, not my room from nine to 11. And then some other guy, if I'm two hours delayed, has to wait on me. You're waiting on you in our IR suite. So our impetus has always been to be efficient. That doesn't mean quick. It means efficient. And so I think our level of efficiency, our ability to deal with patients who may not be, as you say, the most amenable to general anesthesia also is one of the things that makes us different and separates out our ability to do really, really good things uh, for a patient population that sometimes can be difficult. Yeah. And I like in a lot of the stuff that you're doing right now and has tremendous support by neurosurgery and orthopedics, it's a little bit like what we saw with peripheral arterial disease. Back in the day, you know, where we were doing endovascular work and vascular surgery was doing open and they said, you'll never have the outcomes we do doing endovascular. Then I went to a <laughs> <Yeah>. multidisciplinary <laughs> conference, right? With the chairman of vascular surgery saying, Hey, since we've been doing it for a few years, we admit everything should be endovascular and the outcomes are better and safer. And to some degree, right, we're seeing that with our neurosurgery colleagues on some of these is you know, that some of these minimally invasive things that you're doing are amazingly beneficial. That, and they, they're better than the surgical outcome in a lot of ways. You know, look at the, you know, intraspinous spacers, things like that. Looking at some of the data you read. But in a lot of ways, you have to look at it like that. But then the opposite side of that, and you kind of touched on it, is in our image-guided world, we'll develop techniques 
And then five years from now, some subspecialty that maybe it made what they did a little less effective or showed or amplified, they'll steal it just the way it is, right? And now we could better figure out something else. But at the end of the day, if you keep your eye on the fact that this is about patient care and that the right thing's getting done, that's what it'll be. And, you know, that's where you got to tip your hat, like to Riyadh Salem out at, at Northwestern, who really developed an entire arm of interventional radiology, an entire whole field of interventional radiology. And in a lot of ways, Hervé Deramont did the same thing for us in spine. Interventional spine didn't really exist before 1995. You know, and vertebral augmentation was really the birth of minimally invasive image guided interventional spine. So, yes, you know, who knows who's going to be doing it 20 years from now? But while we're still doing it, I don't think there's anybody doing it better than we are. Like you said, those uh, titanium implants that you put in vertebral bodies, um, some people say are kind of the introduction to people doing all of the other uh, advanced procedures that you're doing. So in, in closing, anything that I missed that you want to address? And two, do you want to just say, uh, even though many of us change career paths out of necessity, are you happy with the move you made to be in the Department of Neurosurgery? I, I think a couple of things at the end of the day are, uh, you know, I like to say this a lot to people who ask, it's about what your folks taught you. And so, you know, it's not in the books we look, that we read, but more about the kind of people that you, surround yourself with people that you care about and care about you. And the subspecialty, honestly, doesn't become quite as important. So make sure wherever the path that you take is with people you want to be around every day. And then you'll tend to have made the right decision all the time. I've been very blessed academically that I get to work with guys like you, you know, Doug, across the board. The people that I've met have been part of the real blessings of my career, both nationally and internationally, and that have given me the opportunity to speak my mind, whether they laughed at me when the door closed after or whatever. And then looking at you in particular too, you got to have passions. I think that makes the work, because the workload's always a lot, whether you love it or you don't love it. And as long as when you're in cases, you love what you're doing, then you're in the right field. But you got to have passions outside and you got to have unbelievable support at home. And I'm lucky enough to have both those things. My wife and my family, uh, that's at the end of the day who you're doing it for. Um, but like I said, surround yourself with people you want to be around. And I think you will have taken the correct path um, academically and professionally. If they're not somebody you want to work with, regardless of what subspecialty they're in, you probably don't want to be there. Love it. That was beautiful. And, you know, again, have to thank you, the education for me and for other interventional radiologists and all the other uh, specialists that you've taught along the way. That's, that's the part that's really amazing. Yeah. One of the other things that kind of separates us out too, is that we work with the same team almost all the time. And your techs and your nurses have been your techs and your nurses for 15, 20 years, whatever. So I think that's one of the things that makes our path and our field special. You know, we don't let people rotate in and out during the course of the day and things like that. But at the end of the day, Dan, I just want to say thank you. Um, one of the great privileges is calling you a friend and a colleague. And thanks for including me in this. You know, hopefully people enjoy listening to it. And if they don't, at least they laugh at me listening to it. But um, either way, um, the other thing is if anybody has any questions... One of the things I try to pride myself on is I'm available. So, you know, the podcast didn't end today and you have my contacts. Please feel free. Any guidance I can give, it's certainly how you establish legacy. Appreciate it. And uh, even though you're in DC, you know, I say you've you spent most of your life in, in the two cities Hamilton speaks about all the time. <laughs> yeah. But we'll be bringing you up to the big city of Buffalo later this year. And, and that's yet another... Um, demonstration of your volunteerism, you know, to uh, speak in a uh, journal club that is very multidisciplinary. So that will be IR, pain, vascular surgery, and endovascular neurosurgery. And that's what we're trying to work on. So thank you. And I love that there's deep GW roots even up that way. So when we enjoy the hot wings, right, they'll know. And I love it up there. So look forward to seeing you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza. <laughs> <laughs>
and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and show notes written by Marvie Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Roy Kennebrew. Thanks again, and see you next time.